Hi, and welcome everybody to um, session two of three for the HRSA SPINS initiative, improving health outcomes through the coordination of supportive employment and housing services, otherwise known as the HIV Housing and Employment Project. Uh, we are uh, a project that was funded by SPINS, the Special Projects of National Significance Program, um, as a national initiative to support the design and implementation of and evaluation of interventions that coordinate HIV care, treatment, housing, and employment services that will improve the health outcomes for people living with HIV. Boston University, which is where I work, um, is, uh, and its partners are working as the evaluation and technical assistance provider for this three-year initiative. Um, and we are here to hear from uh, three of the wonderful, the 12, uh, uh, projects that were funded under this initiative, and they are wonderful. So, uh, as I said, this is um, the second of, of three sessions that were dedicated to discussing this project, and um, our overall institute objectives uh, are to describe, describe the complex needs of people with HIV who experience homelessness, housing instability, and unemployment slash underemployment. Um, to develop strategies, to build staff skills and create external partnerships to facilitate care and services, share strategies, resources, and tools that will provide um, integrated care to people with HIV who are out of care, who are homeless or unstably housed, and those who are un- or underemployed. Um, also, finally, to describe the opportunities that uh, other other uh, entities, other agencies could uh, replicate to leverage partnerships within federally funded housing, uh, such as HUD um, programs or employment programs through the Department of Labor, Labor um, as well as other community agencies to serve uh, people who have HIV, who are um, multiply diagnosed and living um, as homeless or unstably housed and also are experiencing unemployment or and our session two of three is uh, going to look at interdisciplinary systems and models for providing care and treatment to people living with HIV who are also experiencing homelessness and un or under employment. So I'm Jessica Flaherty, I'm the project director and as the uh, evaluation technical assistance provider, as I mentioned, I work for Boston University. And I am here with um, folks who are uh, representative, as I said, three of the 12 uh, projects that were funded across the country. First in line, we have uh, Positive Impact Health Centers from uh, Georgia and uh, Gamut's Health Crisis from New York City and um, AIDS Foundation Houston from Houston, Texas. And I'm going to go into further detail about our lovely presenters next. So first up, we have uh, Alfonso Mills. Alfonso is the Study Enrollment Coordinator at Positive Impact Health Center in Atlanta, Georgia. He is a native of South Carolina and studied psychology at Morehouse College. Um, his academic focus has uh, detoured slightly after contracting HIV in 2012, and he has since then had the pleasure of advocating for people living with HIV around Atlanta. Uh, Alfonso also plans to further his education and open his own practice specializing in LGBT people of color, gender studies, um, and rebuilding the will and self-worth of mar marginalized communities. We will um, hear from Alfonso first, but before that, I will also introduce the rest of our presenters. Next up, we have Laverne Hayes. Laverne is the Director of Coordinated Care at GMHC in New York City, New York. Laverne has worked in the social services field for over 15 years. She grew up in a small North Carolina town uh, with her grandmother, who was a foster parent. Um, and when she was growing up, it was ingrained in her to help others. She's previously worked at Housing Works as a supervisor for case management, and currently in her role at uh, GMHC. She is the director of coordinated care, and she um, works at, uh, also in, with t uh, the t Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Care Program, um, Project Health, and the agency's intake department. And she previously oversaw the MRT Housing Program, assistant, um, assisting clients in their nursing homes finding independent housing. And finally, we have Lenika and Lenika Green Sokla. Forgive me if I mispronounced your last name. I always just refer to you as Lenika Green. Um, so <laughs> Lenika is um, 
the data specialist at AIDS Foundation Houston in Houston, Texas. And Lenika is a former kindergarten teacher and fifth grade math teacher for the Houston Independent School District. And after eight years of doing that and educating young minds, Lenika wanted a career path change. She wanted um, more, a more challenging career path that would uh, allow her to focus on a population that's often been neglected and stigmatized by society. So for the past year, Lenika has had the opportunity to empower individuals living with HIV um, by managing their potential barriers and promoting greater self-determination. And she holds a BS in human services and consumer science uh, with an emphasis on child and family development um, and a master's of science in mathematics and uh, a master's of education with spe specialization in um, uh, as an educational diagnostician. We have a wonderful, wonderful uh, panel, as you can see, and we're going to uh, go in the order that they were introduced, and we're going to start off right now with uh, the wonderful Alfonso Mills. So go ahead, Alfonso. Oh, wait, sorry. I do want to also disclose that uh, <laughs> we have no relevant financial or non-financial interest to disclose. Um, just important that we tell all of you that ahead of time. I am also going to go over our, uh, our objectives. So this is for our specific, specific to our own um, individual uh, session. So we are planning today to describe um, implement in interdisciplinary team models for providing care, treatment and housing and employment services for people with HIV who are homeless, unstably housed and unemployed or underemployed. Uh, we're also going to help folks um, obtain skills, um, resources, tools, et cetera, for providing HIV medical care, housing, and employment services for people with HIV. And we're going to help folks learn to set up systems that are similar to those that you'll hear today uh, to make complete referral, making complete referrals and share information across health, housing, and employment programs. Now <laughs> we will go to Alfonso, who will tell us about um, the Herschel Holmes program at Positive Impact Health Subjects. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, it's, it is such an honor to be here with uh, such amazing people doing such amazing work. So as Jessica said, my name is Alfonso Mills. I am the study enrollment coordinator for the uh, for the HRSA Homes Housing Opportunities Medical and Employment Services Intervention at Positive Impact Health Centers right here in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm here to talk about our one-stop shopping model. So um, we are a wraparound service with quite a bit of service for people living with HIV and people that aren't living with HIV. Um, so just to give you all a little bit of background about our agency and what we do. So Positive Impact Health Centers is a little over 25 years old. Um, based out of right here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, they, we serve primarily people living with HIV at three very unique locations uh, across the 25 county geographical region. So we say that they're unique locations because they kind of serve different areas of the city. So we have our Decatur location, which is where this grant is housed, um, which is right in the city, um, kind of on the east side of the city. And it's really close to public transportation. So it's really convenient for clients that live within the uh, metro Atlanta area. Um, so we get a lot of clients that are within the Atlanta city. Um, we also have two other locations. So we have a location in Duluth, which is a, in the northern part of Atlanta, close to Gwinnett County. Um, and then we are also, we just acquired our Marietta location, which is super exciting. Um, that is kind of on the west side of Atlanta. But as you can see, we are doing our best to cover as much um, ground as we can in Atlanta, Georgia, to be able to offer as much services as we can. And once I talk about all the services that, you, that we offer, you will totally understand why. Um, so PIHC, which is kind of a, what we call ourselves, um, short, short for Positive Impact Health Centers, we are a Ryan White Part A, B, and C grantee, um, which helps us offer clinic care and um, food assistance and things like that for people living with HIV. And we also um, received the HOPA grant. Um, and we serve 29 Metro Atlanta counties with our HOPA grant, um, which is awesome because then we're able to offer our TBRA, STRUMU, um, PHP, and gap lodging services uh, to people across the Atlanta area, which is extremely helpful, especially for this project dealing with housing and employment. Uh, we serve approximately 4,900 Ryan White clients annually on top of the clients that we serve that are not Ryan White clients. Um, the HOPA housing program provides services for approximately six 
hundred people per year, which is so needed, especially in the Atlanta area because housing is a complete headache. So being able to offer people living with HIV that housing assistance is so vital um, on so many things. We know how much housing affects healthcare. And then um, we, are, we have intensive efforts to expand the internal prep program uh, over the past two years. So we started off servicing uh, about 100, 150 people. We have grown that program now, um, serving almost 1,000 people annually. So we are really excited about um, the things that we're working on at the agency and what we're doing to kind of progress the services that we are offering our clients. So um, talking more directly about this specific grant. So we were super excited when we uh, heard about this opportunity to incorporate um, employment into uh, our agency, especially because we already had our HOPA department, but um, employment was not something that we were currently doing. So um, we were really excited to get this grant and we were able to recruit 104 total clients um, actually into the study that were eligible, screened, and actually consented into the study. Uh, the average age of our clients was about 36, 37 years old. We had clients that range from 20 years old all the way up to 63. So um, it shows uh, age uh, does not matter when it comes to housing and employment, everybody could use a little bit of extra help. 89% um, of, our, of our clients in this study uh, were cisgender men, 9% of the clients in the study were cisgender women, and then 6% uh, of, our, of our clients were actually transgender women, um, which we found extremely important, especially with Atlanta, um, having so many uh, people of trans experience here in the area. We wanted to make sure that we were figuring out ways to, to um, service uh, people of different backgrounds, of, of different genders, um, and different gender experiences. So we were really happy to be able to recruit for some trans women into our study. 85% um, of our clients in the study are African American, 16% Caucasian, and 3% other. And um, this is pretty important to us because this very much mirrors uh, the population for the clients that we serve at our Decatur location. So we wanted to ensure that we got us to the people that needed it so that we were um, providing equity. So uh, a big majority of our clients in the, in the clinic um, but really in the agency indicator are African American. So uh, it's nice to see that we were able to have that mirror into uh, the clients enrolled into this specific study. So I'm here to talk about us being a one-stop shop. So what does that mean? So we have a wraparound services. So in, in each of our locations, we are able to house a lot of different departments so that we're able to address many different aspects of our clients' lives. So just to kind of let you know what's under our Positive Impact Health Center's umbrella. So we have our HIV clinic, uh, which is of course important because we wanna make sure that people living with HIV are healthy, that they're seeing provider, that they're getting their lab work done, um, and that they're able to get access to medication. Um, so that is extremely important to us. Um, we have our client services, which is actually where our non-medical uh, case managers were actually housed under that department, um, which handles case management, they handle HICP, ADAP, they handle the HOPA services, so making sure that we have um, housing case managers. Um, and then two, just making sure that uh, we have connections uh, within the agency to the different departments as well. So case managers are involved in a lot of different parts of the agency. Uh, we have our behavior health team, which absolutely phenomenal. We have therapists, um, we have interns, we have counselors, uh, we have psychiatrists. Uh, so it just depends on exactly what the client needs. We have an array of behavior health services to fit um, whatever that need may be. Now we have our substance abuse counseling, which is a little bit different from behavior health. So um, while our behavior health team can, hands, can handle substance use, um, we have counselors that specifically deal with people that are um, struggling with substance use or strugg uh, struggling with substance abuse. And then we also have our out outpatient treatment, which we call our impact program, which is housed right there in-house. Um, it's, it's very different from having something that's inpatient, but um, gives the clients a little bit more freedom so that they come, they're able to come for classes, get the counseling. If they're living with HIV, they're able to get um, can, you know, access to care that way as well. But also if you're not living with HIV, you're free to come into that treatment as well. Um, we have our HIV and STI testing and treatment, which is kind of how our agency got started. And now, as you can see, we have grown and developed so much. We have our prep clinic, which I just talked about, and then our newest addition, which has been our pharmacy, which we are so excited about because that has been the true 
um, indicator of how we go to the next level in terms of getting people undetectable or virally suppressed. So adding the pharmacy, that allows the client to come into the building, you can get an HIV test, see a provider, and walk out of our agency. Medication in hand, same day. It's happened. Um, we are super excited to kind of get, um, you know, get more things rolling that way so that we can get our clients taken care of as much as possible regardless of what that need may be. And our pharmacy is about to fill ADAP. Total game changer, super excited. Um, so that, uh, that's a little bit about all of the different um, aspects of our agency. Now I'm gonna dive a little bit more into um, just kind of the social work perspective and how we shaped uh, this housing and employment project uh, to best serve our clients. So PIHC was well positioned to address the client needs from a wide variety of perspectives, whether that be housing, whether that be case management, whether that be substance use, we were able to handle that. So as a one-stop shop for HIV care, um, we offer care from a multidisciplinary perspective. So because we have so much to offer, we wanna make sure that the micro, meso, and macro aspect of our clients are being addressed. So kind of on the ma micro or individual, we wanna make sure that we are offering medical and non-medical case management. So that's offering assistance with getting the medication, but also clients may need assistance with housing or they may need assistance with um, filling out an application for employment or they may need assistance transitioning into healthcare. Whatever it is that they may be, we want to make sure that we um, have some kind of way to offer assistance or at least a referral to connect people to that assistance. And then also individually, we want to make sure that we are offering the best care possible. So whether that be clinic care, um, connecting to providers, we have an on-site lab, so we want to make sure that we are engaged and make sure that the numbers are looking good, that the viral load is decreasing, CD4 count is increasing, all of that great stuff. So um, that's more individual, but on the meso level, we really take to heart the, the community partnerships and referral programs that we have. So with our agency, uh, we did not have employment programs or, or even employment connections when we first started this. So we knew that that was something that we really wanted to um, really hone in and foster those relationships so that they, we can establish something long-term. Um, and we take that to heart because we really want to be able to send clients to uh, an array of options, not just have one or two, um, so that we can get them connected to the things that they're interested in. But also, as they're kind of developing the self-sufficiency, as they're getting into housing and getting employed, we also want to find peer support for them uh, so that people can feel uh, you know, empowered as they're going through these life changes. We want to make sure that they're connected to community. We want to make sure that they have people to talk to and um, that they can be their full selves um, as they're, you know, developing and, and growing in their lives. So uh, we definitely partner with some grassroots organizations that offer that social engagement, that social support um, to increase the social capital of the, of the clients that we're serving. And then as we're, as we're doing that on a more macro level, we want to make sure that we are advocating for people living with HIV to local, elect local elected officials so that um, the policies can change. They are the, policies around, the policies around HIV are very strict in Georgia. And uh, we want to make sure that those policies are one, following science, and then two, are, are beneficial for people living with HIV and people not living with HIV, and that they don't criminalize people with HIV. Um, and a lot of the work that we do really help that. I mean, even housing first, um, that's something that we wanna uh, improve our policies around housing and people living with HIV. And also ensuring that the client's needs are heard at the community level. So um, it's, it's one thing for a client to come to us or, or for us to look at our caseload. It's another thing for us to take the needs of our clients and take the requests of our clients and bring that to community spaces, bring that to community meetings so that we are able to push the needle forward so that we're able to um, improve the services that we are offering. So that's a little bit about how we um, use the social work perspective to impact uh, our clients on a multiple array of levels. So what is a care team? Like, how do they work? What, what, how, do I, how do I use it? Uh, so just to give you a little bit um, about how we, uh, about what a care team is, uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research defines care teams as groups of primary care staff members who collectively take responsibility for a set of patients. The teams blend multi multidisciplinary skills, focusing several people's in, focusing on several people's insights 
rather than just a single physician, um, which is ex extremely important and extremely close to um, how we use care teams right here at PIHC. So um, we define care teams as a group of staff members from different departments within the agency collaborating their expertise to best assist a specific client to achieve their best health while ensuring all parties stay aware of the client's progress. And I emphasize that part because it is so important that when you are on a care team that everybody stays on the same page. Um, it's for the, for the success of the client because um, if one person has one agenda then somebody else comes on with another one, then the client is the one that suffers. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but just to kind of give you a little, a little bit further background, um, about how we use care teams at our agency, we came up with a care teams logic model just to kind of map it out and give you a little bit of visual representation about how we really structure these care teams and how they flow throughout the agency. So on the next slide, we actually break down um, just how it all starts. So of course, we want this to be client-centered so that the clients are getting the help and the assistance that they need. Um, but from the client, they speak directly to the clinic provider or you know, whoever they may see in the clinic, whether that be the provider, nurse, you know, medical assistant, and then the non-medical case manager. And that non-medical case manager is so important because that's who connects the client to all of the other departments in the agency. So, um, and we don't want to bombard the client with so many people, so much information that it becomes overwhelming. So it is important that the non-medical case manager is a conduit to everything else. So um, our, our, the non-medical case manager can connect people to community health workers, which are people that uh, community health workers are kind of peer support that can assist people um, in terms of moving into housing, can help you with filling out an application, can help you go get an ID card or a driver's license. Um, really kind of more hands-on in terms of accomplishing a specific goal. Our behavioral health team is extremely important. Uh, something that we notice is that over 50% of our clients engage in some sort of behavioral health or express interest in behavioral health services. So we know that as, a, as our clients' lives are changing, as they're becoming more self-sufficient, their mental health is so important because if you're not mentally stable, everything else can, can kind of crumble under you. So we want to make sure that our clients are stable mentally as well. Then we have our substance use counselors. If we have um, clients that have a history of using substances, we want to make sure that um, as we get them into employment that they're, they're um, you know, able to take a drug test or able to get the assistance that they need or the counseling that they need to kind of make it through those hard times. As I said earlier, our pharmacy is super important in terms of getting medication, whether that be HIV medication or behavioral health medication or you know, um, heart medication, whatever it is that you may need, um, having all of that right there in-house is so important for adherence. And then HAPWA. So uh, the HAPWA team uh, at our agency worked very closely with our non-medical case managers because it was so important for them to be able to kind of, um, you know, get applications in or know exactly what was needed to have a full application or, you know, after something is processed or after something is approved, making sure that the client is, is aware and that they have a smooth transition into that housing placement. Um, so all of that is super important um, and, and all, every person has a specific place and part in making sure that the client gets everything that they need. Now, with this logic model, you know, we wanted to just test this out. You know, this is um, something that we did very informally, um, but as we got this grant, we noticed that teamwork is so important. So we have some pros and cons, um, some things that we learned along the way. So some pros, because care teams are amazing. They are so helpful. Um, they give the client multiple points of entry into the agency, and that helps maintain engagement and retention. So if you know that you have a six-month follow-up on a client that's coming up, and you also know that they're going to the harm reduction class down the hall, go check on them, go see, you know, go see and um, try and catch them after that, after that class. It, it's nice when they're coming for multiple things because it's easier to engage. Um, also, uh, care teams create an ease of access to multiple forms of health care for a more holistic approach. So they don't come to us just for HIV. They could come for us for, you know, to see a therapist or they can come to us to pick up the medication. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a more holistic approach to life. 
Uh, care teams also gives the client more support to achieve health and life goals. So they have more people on their team personally that's helping them, that's encouraging them, that's pushing them, that's holding them accountable. And that's helpful in terms of uh, the individualized service plans that we do with every client to see, you know, what's going on, what's working, what's not working. And then having care teams um, allows for creative techniques to be um, created because you have multi uh, multidisciplinary backgrounds sitting at the table, all bringing their minds, their expertise to really pour into this client and figure out what we can do to best serve them. Now, there are some cons. <laughs> there are some, some things that we have to think about um, along the way when you are uh, dealing in a care team. So every provider must stay in their, within their own expertise, must stay in your own lane. Um, so the case manager doesn't need to be stepping on the toes of, of the provider. The provider doesn't need to be stepping on the toes of the, the peer navigator. Everybody has a place and everybody um, has to stay in their lane so that the client doesn't get you know, confused or get misinformation. And also every encounter has to be documented. When there are so many people involved in one client, um, it's important that everybody stays on the same page and people can do that when everything is documented. Everybody's able to go and see exactly what happened, see exactly what the plan is so that they know in their own expertise how to move forward. Also, if the team does not communicate, the client is the one that suffers. Um, so as I was saying, you know, it's important that everybody works together as you're working with the client because if, if things get confusing, if things get kind of, you know, mixed up, the client is the one that, that suffers the most out of all of that. So we want to decrease that or eliminate that as much as possible. And also there's a potential for the clients to share different pieces of their story with different people, um, which is also why documentation is important because then we can kind of put those pieces together, uh, but also you don't want to um, allow the client to manipulate um, the staff. You don't want people to kind of, you know, sway one person one way and tell somebody else something, something different and sway them another way. Uh, so it's, as I said, we have to stay on the same page. Um, which kind of leads to some, some case studies uh, that I want to talk about just to kind of give a little background on how we did this and um, how care teams worked at our agency. So on the next slide, we have uh, two clients that I want to talk about. I call this lights, camera, care teams. So we have client one who is a black cisgender male uh, referred to this part the housing and employment project by our behavioral health team. So this person was coming in for behavioral health um, living with HIV, they were homeless, they were unemployed, um, they had a history of alcoholism, a history of depression, and substance use. Um, however, uh, this client is it was very good at maintaining their medication. So uh, although they, and they were able to come into the study because although they were undetectable, they had some um, serious issues with adherence to seeing their provider, adherence to um, you know, making sure that they're coming in and seeing not just their provider, but their behavioral health. And then they have significant trauma and, and things that they're dealing with in terms of housing and employment. Uh, so how do, we, how do we address this? So we started with connecting that client with a non-medical case manager, establishing that rapport, um, really getting to know more about them and their story. The client continued to stay in weekly therapy and then the non-medical case manager began to connect with the therapist to figure out, okay, how can we develop a plan to really support this client into getting them uh, housing, uh, into getting them stably housed and um, readily employed. So what did that look like? So that looked like um, we actually put the client into um, transitional housing. While that client was in transitional housing, the non-medical case manager was doing um, housing visits. Uh, the client was still coming in, checking in with the therapist. We got that client a community health worker, which was extremely helpful in terms of, um, you know, sometimes getting that client out of bed and, and figuring out, okay, are you having transportation issues? Let me, you know, let's get you an Uber. Are you, are you struggling? Are you just feeling bad today? Let me, let me send you some encouragement this morning so that you can kind of get through. And extremely important, especially once this client was able to get a job, to get employed, the community health worker was really helpful uh, in terms of making sure that the client um, had all the information they need in terms of filling out applications and getting direct deposit, things like that. So, um, and now this client is involved in harm reduction class. They stay very engaged. Um, you know, there's ups and downs, wins and losses, but a lot of the wins for this client was being able to get out of the transitional housing, able to get employed, even though they lost their first job. Um, they, they, the fact that they were able to achieve it, let them know that, okay, I was able to get 
that job. So nothing should be able to stop me from getting another one. Um, and that client now is, you know, still on the up, uh, still coming in for weekly therapy. However, just doing so much better in terms of uh, feeling better about themselves and the way that they're navigating um, Atlanta. And then we have our second client, which um, was, is, is close to me because this is actually the first client I ever talked to in regards to this project. Um, this client is a black, trans, a black woman of trans experience, referred to us by a community health worker. Um, they were homeless, unemployed, living under a bridge, uh, doing sex work, uh, and had part-time work on the side as well. This client struggled with adherence, coming in to see the doctor, and they had a fluctuating viral load. So um, because of everything that they were you know, dealing with in terms of life and just trying to survive, um, there was a lot of issues with taking medication and not taking it, then, then taking it again and taking a break. Um, so what we did was we brought this client in, got them connected to the medical case manager. Actually, this client was under 25 years old, for this, so they qualified for uh, something in our agency, which is actually put on by our prevention department, Together Learning Choices, a TLC intervention, which brings together youth that are living with HIV to empower them about how to have safe sex, how to um, kind of overcome life challenges and not let HIV dictate their life. So this client went through that intervention, soared, did so well, um, was able to actually get them connected, stay connected with that community health worker. And the non-medical case manager worked with that community health worker to get this client in the CRIS 180 housing program, which is specifically for people under 25, that this client is now thriving. Um, she is working full time. Uh, she actually, uh, it just went to Florida, is, is working on having some um, gender, gender reassignment surgery. So, I mean, she is doing phenomenal, doing phenomenal. And, and all of that is because the care teams were able to work together to figure out how they can best give, um, give services and, and give um, just assistance and resources to our clients um, in a way that's helpful and beneficial to them. So um, just kind of moving forward. Uh, so what, as, as we are bringing care teams into our agency, um, you know, more structurally, <laughs> I'll say that like that, um, we are implementing care teams and intensive case management for clients with layered needs. So we know that some clients need a little bit more assistance than others. Um, for those clients, we wanna make sure that we wrap around them, not just as an agency, but wrap around them as uh, professionals and, and providers to make sure that they feel supported in everything that's going on. And then adding employment services into our case management practice. So whenever um, our case managers do intakes now, um, we are asking more questions about, well, what's your employment history like? What kind of employment are you interested in? Um, do you have any experience with vocational rehab? You know, tell me about, you know, do you, have you ever been fired? All, all those kinds of things. Um, we are adding that into our just general standard of practice for case management. We are now leveraging intensive case management services for clients with advanced needs um, to other departments in our agency. So if somebody in behavioral health or somebody in substance use um, has a client that really needs case management and really needs um, assistance with housing or employment or just really needs to get back connected into care, um, having, you know, having these um, care team, having a care team approach allows us to really work better together. And then, um, just building stronger interdepartment, interdepartmental collaborations to build systems for better continuity of care for people living with HIV in general. So as an agency, we are uh, just figuring out ways and systems for us to connect with each other and, and to build these connections that we have across departments so that we can, uh, as I said earlier, better fill the gaps for our clients, whatever those gaps may be. And then of course, we want to disseminate this. We want to be able to help all wraparound agencies, all one-stop shops to be able to do what we have done in terms of um, just adding employment to the agency or working together across departments and figuring out ways to really assist people living with HIV in terms of finding stable housing and getting um, steadily employed. Um, and we want to be able to talk about the things that we've learned so that other people can learn from us um, and also just so we can, you know, get this information out to as many people as possible so that we can uh, improve the lives across um, the nation and across the world. So uh, the dissemination is a huge part of us moving forward um, and sharing everything that we have learned. 
Um, again, I appreciate you all. My name is Alfonso Mills from Positive Impact Health Centers in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to me or anybody at my team. Um, we would love to offer any assistance or feedback that we can. Alfonso Mills, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, Alfonso. It was really great to hear about care teams and um, your, you all's approach to implementing your intervention through the use of care teams, wonderful. Um, from here, we're gonna move to discussing um, the, in, the use of the trans theoretical model or uh, the application of the uh, uh, behavior change theory model. And I know um, Laverne Hayes, who is from GMHC in New York City, is excited to share with you all uh, what she has learned uh, through her experience of uh, implementing um, a state or utilizing the stages of change model at Project Health in, uh, in New York. So take it away, Laverne. Oh, we have to, un we have to unmute. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Uh, uh, hi, my name's Laverne Hayes from GMHC, and I want to tell you just a brief uh, about my agency. It was started in 1981 uh, with six gay men and their friends in the living room of Larry Kramer. Uh, and it was to uh, fundraise to provide research for the gay cancer as it was known back in 1981. In 1982, we started the first hotline. The first night uh, was just an answer machine. It received over a hundred calls. We are still providing the hotline today. Some of the services offered at GMHC, we offer a Geffen testing center uh, HIV testing, STD testing. We offer PrEP uh, uh, disbursement. We have our workforce development program. We have a SUNY computer lab. SUNY is one of our state universities. We offer legal services, civil and immigration services. We have a nutrition and wellness department. Dwayne Reed, uh, which is now Walgreens Pharmacy is on site. We offer financial management services to over 500 clients throughout the New York City area uh, for clients that are unable to manage their money. Uh, we receive their social security check and pay their rent and utility bills for them. We have youth services, um, long-term survivors in the buddy program. Uh, as the epidemic has been around since 81, there are plenty of people that are surviving now with the new treatments that have come out. Our buddy program provides uh, services for uh, companion services for clients that are homebound or maybe depressed. They just go out and have coffee with them. We uh, recently became a HAPWA housing provider. We provide strap after hours housing for our undocumented clients. We have our safety and housing program that is for domestic violence victims. We offer mental health services, substance abuse services. We have a women's service department that offers uh, groups uh, healthy living. We offer TGNC services. We have support groups and we offer case management. Project Health has utilized mainly the workforce development program, the HOPWA housing program, the STRAP program, the safety and housing, and our nutrition, nutrition and wellness program. Our nutrition and wellness program offers plenty of complimentary services. Uh, our clients can get haircuts. They have Reiki, they have yoga. Uh, we have uh, quarterly uh, scholarships to the new school if they want to take a class uh, from photography to writing. Uh, the TGNC services, uh, is the program is about two years old and has been in my portfolio. Uh, we offer care coordination services for that demographic. Next. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and Project Health is located in a interdisciplinary care coordination services with our partners that provide HIV care, employment services, and housing services. Our partners are Boom Health, which provides housing to clients, uh, FedCap, which provided over 80,000 vocational and educational and work services for clients, 
Mount Sinai Hospital, which is the largest hospital system in New York City area for primary care, as well as Colin Lord, which provides TGNC services, um, primary care, mental health, and substance abuse services. Next slide, please. The stages of change model. In the pre-contemplation phase, clients are not really thinking about uh, making a change in their life. And this is where the social work case manager and myself come in. We go out, we present the program to uh, other agencies and leave our brochures for clients to begin to think about changing their lives. Some clients uh, in our program that have come from us outreaching have been in SROs for three years and are now independently housed. So in the pre-contemplation phase, the clients are just stuck. They, they don't have any uh, motivation or thought on how they can get to the end. They wanted independent housing, but they just never thought about how, how to get there. In the contemplation phase, they think about it and they decide, uh, maybe I, I want to do something. How do I do it? Uh, that's where our social work case manager comes in. He talks to them. He provides assessments. He does a full psychosocial assessment on them. And we use a Eureka scale that uh, um, helps us to place the clients into our different groups, uh, our action track or our readiness track. In the preparation phase, the client is preparing to either be housed or to find a job. If the client needs educational skills to uh, obtain a particular job, then we help that client with the resources to uh, get that job. The client may need GED classes to complete their education. The client gets enrolled in a GED program and then the client uh, has that high school diploma that um, many provide, I mean, many employers want nowadays. If they need skills, they may go into a trade school. Um, we also are collaborate with um, Alliance for Positive Change, which has a peer support program, uh, peer navigation, the clients complete that. And at the end of that, um, the AIDS Institute certifies them as peer navigators and they earn a higher salary than the $15 minimum wage. The client moves to the action phase. He's working with the transitional benefits counselor, learning what life would be like after he becomes uh, employed and housed, learns how to maintain a budget, uh, what the transitioning is off of uh, HRA services, entitlement services, so that it's not a shock to the client when he makes over the income and his services are cut off. And then there's the maintenance phase where we provide uh, constant contact with the clients um, to make sure that they retain the housing and they retain the employment. Now clients can move back and forth between the different stages. They may go from uh, the maintenance and be ready to graduate and something happened, they may lose their job or they may just give up on working and then have to come all the way back and start back in the contemplation phase or the pre-contemplation phase. Clients can move in and out of these phases uh, throughout until they are steady. Next slide, please. Okay, the team structure is the social work case manager the transitional benefits counselor, the peer counselor, and our partners that we work with. Next slide. The social work case manager provides comprehensive assessments. He does demographic data, family composition, social supports that the client have, a psychological history, psychosocial history, a housing history, legal history, medical history, mental health and substance use history, risk assessments for trauma, domestic violence, uh, education and employment history, and present situation strengths, challenges, and goals, and summary recommendation. And this has uh, proved very uh, effective and useful for the program because the social work case manager is mainly the case manager for the entire program. 
and he has insight on all the clients. So when uh, the team meets, he's able to help the team and guide them on tools to use to get the client to the next step. Next slide, please. Uh, our additional team members, as I spoke before about our transitional benefits counselor, our particular counselor that we have has been in the field for 15 years uh, doing workforce. So he knows how to help clients with budget and knows the system of transitioning off of entitlements. He also uses the psychosocial uh, support for the clients. Uh, personal, he develops a personal transition benefit plan that helps the client knows, the client will know then when uh, his benefits are gonna cut off. Uh, we don't want clients going in, getting a job, and then after a year, then they're not prepared for the benefits uh, to go away because the client is fully employed and is making over uh, the amount uh, that is required for to continue benefits. If the client needs, uh, assistance with finding employment, the Transitional Benefits Counselor is there. He also provides groups, so the clients come in, they sit in in the groups. Uh, each group is tailored for a different topic, and the benefit of using groups are they have each other to uh, bounce ideas off and give uh, support to. The Peer Care Navigator, he provides group support. Um, this was a mostly uh, attended group, uh, the peer navigator group. Um, the clients were in this group constantly uh, because each of them, you know, as one found housing or achieved uh, employment, they were other, able to encourage the other uh, clients to move along. He also mainly provided assistance with housing and made realtor calls and conducted outreach. Uh, he would go out, uh, all the team members would go out and do home checks on the client, uh, assist with the clients with, uh, if they were moving into a new apartment, you know, check out the agencies so that we could gather as much as we could to help the clients going into their new apartments. Next slide, please. And our uh, service menu, I mentioned before, our readiness track and our action track, they're completed. Our Eureka scale is completed every 90 days and the client is assessed. Uh, we provided individual support counseling, referrals to coordinated medical, legal, and social services. And the readiness support groups, um, the topics are similar to those in the action track. Uh, how to maintain employment, how to maintain housing. Um, but they were all in preparation for getting the client to that final phase of maintenance. They had uh, a once a week orientation uh, for the, I'm sorry, once a month orientation for new clients coming in uh, so that everyone could be familiar with how the groups would run. In the action track, uh, these are clients that have moved along a little further the transitional benefits counselor uh, ran this group mostly, providing linkage to housing, employment, RREP service, and other supportive services. Psychoeducational groups, housing and report, employment retention groups. In our peer support group, uh, there were peers providing one-on-one -on -one support to each other. Um, there were peer supports in the readiness track and the action track. Next slide, please. Of the 108 clients that we housed, I mean, that we had in our program, 69 clients were housed, 49 clients were employed. Uh, of those clients, uh, 38 clients were housed and employed and graduated from the program after maintaining housing and employment for a year. Uh, we did also offer uh, these same services to clients that were not part of the study, so they are continuing to use the services. Um, I think one thing that was uh, great about this program is the coordination between us and the other providers. If the clients were not using the services from our, the workforce services or the employment services from our agency, we were in constant contact with them at FedCap or at Fortune Society. 
Fortune Society uh, was very instrumental in helping some of our clients that had some uh, history of incarceration to find employment. Next slide, please. Now for my client story, I wanna talk about our client, 007 is what I'll call her. This client is a transgender client that came in uh, age 35. The client uh, was from Ghana. Um, the client suffered a lot of trauma, uh, had been raped several times. Her family had uh, disowned her and put her out uh, because of her uh, sexual orientation. So she came to America, but the client had been working the streets. The client came into the program and basically uh, in the beginning, the client wanted housing, but I talked to the client and I told her that, you know, we didn't just provide housing. It was also an employment program. And has she ever thought about getting work? And the client told me her aspirations of that she wanted to go to school and she wanted to be a lawyer so that she could go back home and help other transgender clients uh, such as herself. I uh, introduced the client to our workforce program and the client got a part-time position in that program. Um, the client ended up working full-time because uh, she did such a wonderful job. Uh, working with clients in workforce and helping to motivate them to um, want to do better in their life. Uh, currently, this client is in City College. Um, she's no longer working at our agency. She is working though, she's working part-time, but she's at City College uh, going on to uh, begin her college career so that she can get her uh, law degree and go back home and help others. Uh, Again, I think um, part of the reason this program was so successful is because our agency has been around a long time and we are really work hard with our other uh, community partners. You know, if we don't have the service, we don't mind referring our clients to other services and to make sure that the client gets what they need. And I, um, as the director of the intake department, you know, I was able to help guide the clients to incentives that were uh, used. You know, my, I ran a viral suppression uh, program where the incentive the client got $100 every uh, quarter, a gift card for $100 every quarter as long as they became uh, state virally suppressed. So this was uh, a program that several of the clients utilized. And all of the groups provided uh, metro cards for the clients so uh, the clients could easily come back and forth. And even if the client was going out to look for housing, we provided the clients with metro cards. So the program really was um, successful because the team worked hard to make sure that the clients had everything that they need and stayed in constant contact uh, throughout. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I will take any questions at the end of the presentation. And thank you so much, Laverne. Wonderful Laverne Hayes, ladies and gentlemen. I think in addition to um, the successes that you named, I would also just say that your leadership and the longevity um, that you brought to this project, um, having done this work for many years and that uh, experience of your staff as well. Um, and utilizing such a client-centered approach um, and really meeting them where they were at as far as how prepared they were to, uh, to, to take the next step was really um, a, rather, a feather in your cap. So thank you so much, Laverne. Thank you. Um, and our next presenter is uh, Lenika Green and she's from um, AIDS Foundation Houston and she's gonna talk about their unique approach to working with a, a Department of Labor um, a partner, and this is something, this is a, a partnership that did not previously exist, but Lenika and the team over there in Houston built this partnership from the ground up to have um, an actual DOL partner um, made, uh, called Workforce Solutions, and she's going to talk about that. So please take it away, Lenika. Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to thank Jessica for the lovely bio, and it is a pleasure being on a panel with two other agencies who are who have the same ideas in mind to help those people living with AIDS and HIV. So this is a great opportunity. I look forward to sharing a lot of information with you all. And um, at the end, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to assist you all. 
Um, I want to first start off talking about um, our unique partnership um, with our FQHC, which is Avenue 360, as well um, as AIDS Foundation Houston. Avenue 360 actually um, began as a aid service organization. They placed emphasis on um, serving communities of color, specifically African American and Hispanic people living with AIDS and HIV, and they wanted to provide quality health services in the area um, for those particular clients by providing them primary care, pharmaceutical um, services, behavior help, social work, peer education, counseling, HIV testing and referrals, and also other housing related um, services. Well, recently Avenue 360 had become a FQHC, which is a federally qualified health center, um, providing Ron White's part A, B, and D programs. And this integration provided an additional services to people living with AIDS and HIV um, beyond what Ron White could pay for as well um, as providing a timely coordination of care um, with the electronic health record um, supporting evidence-based care. So what that basically means now with them becoming an FQHC, they're able to provide more assistance to people living with AIDS and HIV. Um, here at AIDS Foundation Houston, we are a ASO, which is an AIDS service organization. And we were the first AIDS service organization here in Texas, um, beginning our grassroots organization comprised of basically helping those who were transitioning because of the deadly illness. However, over the last 35 years, we've grown to a robust community-based organization, being able to transition into a multifaceted health and human service organization, providing supportive services for over 4,000 men and women and children living with AIDS and HIV. Um, our agency also helps with HIV prevention education to almost um, 92,000 individuals and testing to almost um, 1,700 individuals annually, um, most of whom come from a high-risk population, including inmates out of the Texas prison system, gay, bisexual, or transgender men and women, um, and anyone else who um, are needing the services that we provide. Not only do we provide testing, um, we also provide food assistance to clients who need assistance, income support system, which can be housing, um, transportation support, legal assistance, um, healthcare assistance by way of referrals, and like Positive Impact and GHMC, we provide wraparound services. Now, another thing with um, AIDS Foundation Houston and Avenue 360, what made us unique and what our goal was is to address the needs of um, a disadvantaged population. Anytime we have a partnership with anyone, there are always pros and cons, and what we focus on are the pros of um, having this partnership. This was an opportunity, um, as you know, there are several agencies that may provide AIDS and HIV services to those clients affected. So this was an opportunity for us to remove silos within the ASOs. That basically means instead of having one organization promoting the services that they have and strictly enforcing individuals to go to one place, well, you have two agencies that are able to provide that. If Avenue 360 is not able to provide something for the client, we have a partner here with AFH. If we're not able to, Avenue 360 or any other agencies that provide services for people living with AIDS and HIV. Also, um, this partnership was excellent because when we thought about a program, we were thinking, how can we recruit people? What do we need to do in order to recruit those people? So with having the FQHC, having the clients that we actually needed, they were able to refer them over to the program so that we can move forward to assist those that are in need. Of course, with every partnership, you have a few cons. So when we begin our, our, our mind frame, we thought about it like, oh, well, we can get all of our clients from Avenue 360. Everything is going to roll fine. Well, of course, um, we did do that. And we had to deviate just a little bit from our original plan. So all of our clients didn't come from Avenue 360 as planned. We had other agencies that we work with, clinics that we work with to help us get our numbers up in our program. Well, if we look at the partnership, um, as our design originally started, Avenue 360 case managers would identify those clients with unmet needs. Those unmet needs will be individuals who are homeless, who are unemployed or underemployed, who are unstably housed, who are not linked to care. Those clients were clients that we were looking for to actually serve in our program. Now, once the clients have been identified, they are actually referred to our outreach specialists who pre-screen the clients. Our outreach specialists tell them about our program, what we offer, what services we have, what resources are available, and the benefits of participating in the program. 
Once the clients do pass the pre-screening, agree to participate in the program, then they are referred to AFH Network Navigator, um, who provides non-medical case management and other supportive services. Now, again, this is a pro for having a partnership. Avenue 360 as a FQHC could provide medical case management. And on our side, as non-medical case management, all additional services that the clients are not receiving at Avenue 360, they'll be able to receive it at AFH. Now, what's most important, um, as we learn to um, listen to our clients and figure out what needs and services were more important to our clients, of course, number one is always housing. However, um, listening to what they're saying, another big thing that we focused on was employment. We had several clients who were underemployed, who were unemployed, who had no job skills. And as a team, we had to come together to figure out what can we do to be able to assist the clients? How can we get these clients employed? What is it that we can do to help them? Well, when we thought about a who and a what, who do we need? What do we need? We need an employment specialist, somebody who can come in to provide employment services and resources to our project core clients. What does that look like? Anybody who can come in and provide any type of classes or just teach the clients how to look for jobs or anything of that nature, that's what we focused on. How do we find that? When and where? Well, we actually began our program in June of 2018. We started a little bit later than some of the other agencies, but in the process of attending a community resource fair, um, we ran into a Department of Labor company, which is the Workforce Solutions. And during this, re, um, this community resource, I was sitting in a class and they were giving a little class. And I'm like, well, you know what? Do y'all come out to other agencies to do that? And they were like, yeah, you know, here's the number. Contact us. Let us know what you do. Well, how and why did we do this? Imagine in a big city like Houston, Texas, you're trying to go into a department of labor to receive some assistance. So you're one of 80 people in an office waiting to see one employment specialist. Well, what we decided, instead of having to send them to the workforce different solutions, the clients are already coming into AFH into the local, um, excuse me, the corporate office, why not have someone come here? Why not have someone to come and teach these clients what they need in order to succeed? And that's what we actually did. And that's how we made this happen. So with the Workforce Solutions being able to come in, they provide workforce development services to, um, to employers and job seekers by promoting and supporting workforce systems that create values and offers employees, individuals, and communities an opportunity to receive um, sustainable economic prosperity. So some of the services that they provide, which we're listening to the clients and this fell right along, job readiness workshops. What does that look like? Resume writing, cover letter writing, how to look for a job, how to prepare for a job. What do you need to say in an interview? Interview assistance, interview mock, I mean, excuse me, mock interview testing. That's what the clients had actually received. Career counseling, where are you at in your career? What are you looking to accomplish? Where are you trying to go? So you actually have this counsel that's in house that is able to assist the clients with that. Computer training, we learned that a lot of clients that we had were not computer literate at all. They could barely log on to a computer Computer. So just to have the basic computer training to help them advance in their um, employment career, something that we offered. Job search assistance, not just getting online and saying I'm looking for a job here or there. The Workforce Solutions provides a website full of employment based on what it is that you're looking for, your salary, your skills. The clients were able to get one-on-one -on -one training with this, um, the Workforce Solutions representative in order to do that. Workforce Solutions also, also vocational and training referrals. Basically, if you have a client who's looking into doing some type of vocational training, that can be welding, CNA, medical assistant, medical office worker. They have an opportunity to have these classes paid for and actually obtain that training to help them continue to move forward with their employment goals or with their employment route that, that, that they're actually looking for. And lastly, they offer um, free assistance for certica certifications leading up to employment. That goes back to like the vocational training. So if you need an IT certification to do something or you need um, something else, community health worker certification, medical assistance certification, phlebotomy certification, the Workforce Solution provides assistance, financial assistance to those clients. And as we're thinking about the Workforce Solutions and how they can benefit from us, we're thinking we have clients who don't have any skills. 
here's the way we can get our clients skills. You can go to school for free. You can get a certification for free. You can receive training for free. You can receive counseling. So any barrier that our client would address to us, we had a solution for it. And the Workforce Solutions was that solution to help with employment, as that was a big problem that we were experiencing with some of our clients. Now, again, the benefits of the program that we had with the Workforce Solutions, the clients are able to attend the workshops here at AFH. So again, as I gave the analogy, as far as them going into an actual facility where a regional facility will assist them, 80, 90 people, you're there probably six, seven hours a day only to get a piece of paper to say you have to come back. Or you get there and the classes are full, so you're just stuck there. Um, another thing is the one-on-one -on -one, um, training provided by the Workforce Regional Facilitator. Our class sizes are usually between 7 to 10 people, maybe 12 people at the max. But imagine one facilitator per 12 persons as far as one facilitator per 60 to 70 people in the class. You don't have that one-on-one -on -one contact. You can't ask questions. You can't actually visualize or have someone to individually sit down and show you different things that was the best thing that we can actually have for our clients. And another thing to kind of add, you have clients who have anxiety about being around in crowds. Some clients who are embarrassed to speak up in front of other people about their lack thereof or what they're not comfortable with. Well, the smaller class sizes, the one-on-one, -on -one, the job assistance search to actually teach them how to go through line by line was an excellent benefit to our organization. Now, I'm gonna share a few outcomes with you guys. Um, originally, we, again, we started June of 2018. We started off very slow. It took us some time to recruit clients. It took us some time to figure out what is going on. And we got a little frustrated, and I'm not gonna tell the story. It was more so like, what can we do? How can we make these positive outcomes? What are we gonna do? So with the Workforce Solutions, I'm going to start off with our baseline beginning June of 2018. As you can see, we had 66% of our clients were unemployed. Um, the numbers that equal, we actually enrolled 111 clients um, for the program. 66, that's, that's over 73 people who were unemployed. 73 people were unemployed. We actually had 15 people who were underemployed. Underemployed could be part-time work, temporary work, paid under the table, or just, you know, here and there work, just, you know, receiving cash on a daily. Also, um, for unemployed, underemployed, excuse me, and something other, something other is just you just doing whatever you can do to get whatever you can get some income. Well, as of April 2020, I am pleased to say that our employment numbers has increased by 31%. So what these numbers look like now, um, as far as our clients who are employed, 43 of them who are employed, 44 um, are unemployed. Um, the unemployment decreased by 32%, but there are a lot of factors that we looked into that, and I'll go into that in just a second. Um, underemployed, 18 clients, and only four of them something other. Um, as we know, beginning of March, the pandemic hit. So our numbers kind of fluctuated, which we had a higher number of clients who were employed, but due to the pandemic, that number decreased. So as of now, these are the numbers, and I can see them sliding down a little bit more, but as of April 2020, still with a 31% increase in employment mm -hmm. over a year and a half, I like to put kudos to that. And I like to say that was an excellent thing that we did. And not only we as a team with Project Core, but with the help of the Workforce Solutions and those classes having the individuals to come in. A lot of people don't realize the importance of having that one-on-one -on -one relationship with an employment coach to help motivate someone who felt like they couldn't do anything or that they wouldn't be successful in anything that they had to do. It really worked out well for us and for our benefit, and I really, really appreciate that with them. Now, when we look into sustainability, how do we sustain this program? How we continue to move forward? What are we looking forward to um, moving forward even after our program enrollment end? 
well, we want to continue to pro, um, promote Project Core and our available resources. So although we're no longer taking new clients, the resources are still available, the services are still available, whatever you need is still available. We wanted to continue to provide job readiness workshops. Unfortunately, with the pandemic being down now, I mean, excuse me, with the pandemic striking, um, a lot of the workforce solutions, pub, I mean, offices are closed and our offices are closed. So what we're doing now in the interim, we're actually allowing the clients to go in and look online or providing them with different job resources or links for them to be able to do different work. Um, we're calling the clients on the phone. We're able to speak to them one-on-one. -on -one. And if they do have access to computers, we're able to provide them with different links. If they don't and they have cell phones, we're able to provide them with the links via text message. And lastly, if they don't have a computer or a cell phone, then what we normally do is just word of mouth or try to meet the clients where they are to let them know, hey, this place is hiring. This is what you can do. You need a bus card. We can get you a bus card. This is what we're doing. So when they call in, we can give it to them hold them accountable for doing what they're supposed to do and be able to assist them. We're still encouraging them to obtain job readiness skills. Although the pandemic has hit, that does not mean that you cannot educate yourself. Rather, you're doing it on the computer, on your cell phone, or you have pieces of paper that has been provided to you by the Workforce Solutions representative, you have no excuse. <laughs> We're going to get you back with whatever you need. Also, we want to um, encourage clients to attend vocational and certification training. Those who don't have any training, those who don't have any skills or any employment background, any employment history. I tell the clients all the time, you can give me an excuse, but I'm going to have something back for you. Or you can tell me what you want to tell me, but I'm going to have a rebuttal for you. It's going to be positive. You may not want to hear it, but it's not an excuse I haven't heard. And it's not a challenge or a barrier that I'm not able to address. So I keep my guns up at all times with the clients. <laughs> also, we provide clients with incentives. So um, what those incentives are, if you get a job, you get a little incentive. It may not be much, but it makes the client feel good and they feel appreciated, like you're really pushing them. Um, if you're needing like transportation, you got an incentive for that. As long as you're looking for a job, you can get a bus card. If you're referring people to look for jobs or different things like that, you can get a gift card. If you obtain the job, you can get a gift card. If you need clothes, we can incentivize you with that as well. So we are working with the clients. We are trying to motivate them and continue to motivate them even through this pandemic. We're also creating opportunities for community and client engagement. That means basically if there's a job fair, we're trying to get everybody together. If we're hosting something, we try to get other agencies to come to support the clients. If we know the clients are out doing something and they need support from the agency, we try to um, and we try to um, excuse me engage with the clients as well. And also we're providing evaluations to see where we are, where we need room for improvement. This is very important, um, especially to myself. We can do things and think we're doing a good job for the clients, but the clients may not like that. The clients may not understand different things of that nature. So the evaluations are to see where the clients are. What do the client need? We think we can know everything that the client needs, but sometimes the client may not verbalize what it is. So you have to go back and kind of think, okay, well, I could have did it this way. I could have did it that way. I could have said it this way. We could have offered this, or we couldn't have offered that. Or they don't like the snacks that we're giving. We need to try something different. You know, or don't give them snacks. Let them come with their own snacks. No. <laughs> but we'll try to do the best that we can to um, see where there's room for improvement. We're never perfect. And there's always something that we can do to correct things or to make things right. And I am so open for suggestions. I'm so open for improvement and changes. And, you know, we just kind of, roll with the punches. Now, what I'm gonna do is share a client success story. This is my friend, Barry. So when Barry came in, and this is so funny because he scared me, he startled me. He was a walk-in client. He was homeless, he was unemployed, has been off his medication for five months. He suffers from depression, anxiety. He had no transportation, no income, limited job skills. Now, Barry called me every day after he came in for his initial um, appointment. He missed a couple of appointments and kept trying to reschedule. And finally, I was like, Barry, when you're serious, let's, let's, let's get this to work. You know, I'm here. When you're ready to come to, no problem. His main focus was housing because he was homeless. 
Barry couldn't see past anything else except wanting to be housed. So as we got Barry into the office to explain the program, he agreed. He was like, okay, well, I need housing. I need this. I need that. He's just so anxious. And I never worked with a client like that before. So I had to learn patience and I had to understand Barry needed some help. So first thing we did was completed a housing assessment because again, to Barry, he couldn't see anything else because he was homeless. He needed a roof over his head. He needed somewhere to stay. So we first completed a homeless assessment for him. And um, he was actually, you know, in turn referred to a housing program. This was after some months, but we got him into a shelter, a men's shelter, where he could stay, you know, for a few nights. And eventually he transitioned into a transitional living facility. And that was a little bit more comfortable for him because he didn't want to be in the shelter. Well, he was also referred to our LCDC for a mental health evaluation because not only has he been off his medication, his um, AIDS medication, he's also been off his mental health medication. He was hesitant, again, about attending the weekly because we have the workforce classes weekly. He was hesitant about that because his, again, main focus was housing. But eventually we talked to him, let him know, hey, once you get a place, you need a job. What if you don't have a job? How are you going to play for your place? You're going to end up in this situation again. So let's focus on the job. You have a roof, temporary roof over your head. How are we going to get to work? What are we going to do? But because he didn't have any like job readiness skills, he was like, you know what? I want to be a welder. What do they do for welding? Well, we was actually able to get him into one of the welding programs um, through the Workforce Solutions. And after six months, he completed his welding certification. He is now, as of now, June, let me, excuse me, July the 3rd, 29th, he's stably housed with the Hopper funded program. He's in one of the AFH housing programs. He has his own apartment, little one bedroom, and he got a dog. <laughs> he's employed full time with the city of Houston. So not only did he get a wellness certification, he's able to work for the city that he was once homeless in. Yeah, he's virally suppressed. He is currently on his medication. He attends bi-weekly therapy sessions. He volunteers at like local homeless shelters and um, to provide food um, to different people in their different food pantries. And just last month, Barry got a car. <laughs> he was so excited about the vehicle. Um, you know, he just drove by. He was like, well, I'm by the agency. I was like, well, we can't have visitors and we're not there. He was like, I just want to show you my car. And I was like, okay, well, I'll meet you at Starbucks and you can show me the car. So we got around to the Starbucks and he just started blowing the horn. Miss Green, I got a car, I got a car. I was like, well, okay, Barry, can I borrow $5? No. <laughs> but all that, I say all that to say, wraparound services and the coordination for both the FQHC and the ASO, um, that's, that's a partnership that can help a client in so many aspects. Although we're not able to provide the client with everything that we need, the resources that we're able to provide the clients, the referrals that we're able to refer, um, excuse me, provide the clients, and just that partnership together kind of brings it all into one. Imagine if we wouldn't have met Barry or we would have just pushed Barry somewhere else. We have a habit, not we have a habit, but I've seen a habit of telling the client, well, we don't provide this service. We don't offer this service. Well, we have to send you here. We have to send you there. Barry was able to get an assessment done in-house, take classes in-house, receive the services that he need in-house, everything done under one roof. Imagine if he had to travel all around Houston to go. I know like in Atlanta, it's huge. New York is huge. Boston is huge. But just imagine having to travel all over these places to do these different things when you have one stop shop to get everything that you need to be able to help the client. Imagine how many more clients like Barry that we've helped. This is just one particular client that we're speaking of. And with the Workforce Solution providing those different services as well, imagine how many more clients that we can see have a more self-sufficient lifestyle, have a more positive outlook on their life, who wants to continue to be virally suppressed, who wants to continue with their medication, and who would love to be in their own place supporting themselves. Um, I'm going to conclude my story here because I know we may have questions. I really enjoyed you all. So I am open to any questions and concerns um, at the end of the presentation. My contact information will be there. So thank you guys again. And I really do appreciate this opportunity to share the, the things that we're doing here at Avenue 360 and AIDS Foundation Houston. Monika Green, thank you. Wonderful. So wonderful to hear the story um, that you had to tell, not only because you've got this great example with Barry, but also because Yours is such a great example of 
partnership with the Department of Labor, partnership with between an aid service organization and FQHC in a time when uh, aid service organizations are really um, few and far between. So to see this really, you know, happy, healthy, great collaboration between the two organizations is so great. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, and thank you again to all three of our wonderful presenters. Um, again, these are just three examples of the, uh, the 12 sites across the country who are doing um, equally amazing things. Um, and we do hope that you will join us for, uh, for more of the sessions that we have on offer throughout the conference. Um, if you'd like more information about the HIV Housing and Employment Project, um, please go to um, our website, and this is a, a, a live link in um, these slides, as I believe they will be made available to you, but you can find us um, there. And if you'd like to reach out to us individually, you can feel free uh, to reach out to me, Jessica, um, and my BU address, and then we've also got Alfonso and Laverne, and we have Lanika's um, uh, AFH um, email address right there at the, on the last. Um, and then um, again, if you would like uh, to receive a continuation, continuing um, education credits for participating in this um, workshop, please uh, feel free to reach out to Ryan White and um, you can click on the link right there for more information about that. We would like to thank you for attending the second session of our three, uh, the three sessions um, for our, our institute. And uh, we would like to now spend some time taking in questions you might have for um, our lovely panelists. Thank you so much.